Good morning and welcome, members and friends of Cornerstone Bible Church. Just a couple of announcements as we begin. All regular events are postponed, including men's fellowship and the workday. We still need to put together uh, mowing teams, and we'll have to get the mowing, mowing going soon, so please email or call Bob Watts if you're able or willing to be a part. We'll try to decide a little more this week what a partial or complete online Easter week might look like, and so I'll be watching for that. <clears throat> People have asked about offering. We are uncomfortable with online giving at this time, so we should be okay for the next couple of weeks. If, if, if this uh, <laughs> new normal becomes goes for a little longer than that, we can set up a system where we can perhaps mail in our offerings. But now let's commence with our best attempt to keep some continuity among the scattered people of God at Cornerstone Bible Church. Pastor John decided to continue the series begun two weeks ago, Sunday night, in the book of James. So let's look at James 1 together. I'm reading from the New American Standard Translation, James chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. As we noted in the email on Friday night, we were just getting ready to announce that we would attempt what we did last week for church when we got the announcement of further restrictions because of the virus. And so we as a church continue with change. How do you do with change? I know that for me, it was a very draining week, attempting to make decisions not only for myself and for my family, but especially for us as a church. There are so many things to consider, as well as regular things that need to be done, sometimes in an irregular way. Talking with some of you, I'm hearing similar stories. So if life were all about us being fully rested and comfortable and predictable, then perhaps we would have a right to feel that this week has been a little much and the best thing for us would be to return to something controllable. While it is right to establish good patterns and want order, our passage today reminds us that trials are a part of life down here and that one of the emotions during those times of trial should be joy. Joy seems to go against uncertainty, sickness, death, and against a restless mind that is thinking ahead of all the possibilities. Joy is more than just a smile or a little laughter, something that's fleeting. It's an attitude that conveys hope, contentment, and thankfulness. If we're to head toward a worldview that includes both trials and true biblical joy— we must have a wider perspective than merely what fights against the perspective of joy. So what would give us a wider perspective? A number of things. But how about starting with your position? Pastor John preached on verse 1 a couple of weeks ago. Do you remember how James described himself? As a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. A servant is not in charge and is not the one who provides, but is a servant of one who is in charge and who does provide. The owner-master provides from their means, from their character, from their position, and from their provisions. Are you a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, if so, then who is God? Who is Christ for you? Do you remember our union with Christ that we talked about on Wednesday night? What provisions come from the Godhead, and what is the Godhead doing that goes beyond our normal gaze? 
we're still trying to figure out what we can and are allowed to do with songs that are live or stream, live streamed or pre-recorded. So we'll stick to hymns for today. Would you look at what God is doing in this hymn, and would you worship with me? Father, what a special way to start with a thank you. Thank you for your being in control. Thank you for the reality that we have strength to be here. Thank you for these five who are working, setting this up. This is new for us, Father, you know that. But thank you for the desire that we have to worship. And for those who are watching and listening in, who are also joining with us at various times. Lord, thank you that you are omnipresent. You are here with us. You are with each one who is listening. You are throughout the world. And Father, this is a world crisis from the world's perspective. And yet, Father, it hasn't caught you by surprise. Father, you're well aware. And you know the reasons behind why it is here. Thank you for ones many of us have talked to who are starting to think about spiritual things. I praise you for that. Thank you once again that you would use it, Father, to remind us of your goodness, of your mercy, of your grace, but also of your justice, of your righteousness, your holiness, and of the fact that we are answerable to you. Whether we believe in you or not, dear God, every one of us is answerable to you. Thank you, Father, for sending the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son. Thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross. Thank you that you were willing to be separated from your Father, from perfect fellowship. Separated so that we might have an opportunity to be reconciled to you. Thank you, Jesus, for carrying our sins, my sin. And I praise you for that. And Father, for what it is to be a child of yours, to be secure. Secure for today in the midst of this crisis. Secure for eternity through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Father, some of our people are sick. Some of them have been moved to various places. And Lord God, we would commit them to your care. Father, that you would reach out to them as only you are able to, to give comfort, to give peace. Father, to be with them. You are the healer. 
As you see fit, dear God, may you be glorified through the help that you alone are able to give. But Father, once again, we would ask for your blessing now. Father, as we try to share your word, as we try to share our hearts, as we attempt to give praise to you and thanks to you through song, Lord God, thank you for that opportunity. We ask your blessing. And as your word goes forth, you have promised, dear God, it will not return empty. We pray for our president. We pray for the leaders. We pray for a divided country in so many ways. We pray for a sinful country in even more ways. And we pray, dear God, for your Holy Spirit's moving. Yes, through the pulpits, through the airways, Father, through whatever method is being used now, dear God, to get out the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, could there be a stirring? Could there be a revival? Lord God, you are able. May your perfect will be done as we come here now to worship and to praise you. And Father, I pray to truly bring joy to you. We love you, Lord. We are unworthy, but we thank you and praise you for grace and mercy through Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading is from Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men. And the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. That no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble. And by it many be defiled. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected For he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. Amen. How do you do with change? Well, it depends on what is underneath. There's no relationship with God that heaven acknowledges that does not have a growing trust in God's words and in his will. 
If you only trust and obey Christ when things are going your way, when life makes sense and seems livable, then your faith is weak and faltering. Well, this is not merely something to feel guilty about, because then you're only looking at yourself. That kind of faith does not bring glory to God. It is not God-worthy. Hence, our passage talks about the testing of our faith. Why? To eliminate us? No. Unregenerate faith will be exposed. If not down here, then at the final judgment. In our passage, faith is tested to perfect, to make your faith perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Do you want this? Those saved will have a growing desire for this. This goal of perfecting and strengthening faith is at the heart of Hebrews 12 as well. Discipline in this passage is not focused on paying back for falling short, but on bringing us into line with all that God intends. He disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. Holiness sounds like a good goal. The goal of God's shaping and training is further described as the peaceful fruit of righteousness. If that is the goal... Will you submit as a bondservant? Wait, as a beloved, legitimate child of God to your father's control, his plans and ways? Hebrews 12 says that this is done by fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Look at him. Learn of him. You must, so that you do, don't grow weary and lose heart. In times like these you need a Savior In times like these
Our passage tells us that the testing of our faith produces endurance. Endurance for what? Hebrews didn't merely tell us about God's discipline, our position in Christ, and the need to continually look to Christ. It left us with a job to do. Do you remember the end of that passage we read? Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled, that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. These are some tough assignments. No wonder we need a robust faith Don't put all your resources and focus on the coronavirus and effects from it. Include it, but see and do beyond it. Don't focus on your failures or insecurities, or even just on these tasks or others from Scripture. Focus on Christ and follow. From your union with Christ, accomplish God's kingdom kingdom goals. Do you remember this second version of So Send I You? Would you think of, of this as the goal of the testing of your faith as Pastor John preaches? So send I you by grace made strong to triumph or hosts of hell or darkness and sin my name to bear and in that name to conquer so send I you my victory to win so send I you Once again, we open our Bibles to the book of James, chapter 1, Growth in Normal Times. Let us pray. Father, thank you that you've entrusted the sending forth of the gospel, but also the living out of the gospel to sinners like us here. And Father, I pray even now, for that which you have promised, 
your word going forth by the power of your Holy Spirit, not returning empty or void, but accomplishing your purpose. Yes, even for such a time as this. And this I ask, depending upon trusting in the one, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. No, these aren't normal times. As I look around, I'm seeing faces that are normally here on Sundays or Wednesdays. I'm seeing them in my mind because uh, the reality is there are five out here working, sharing with us. No, it's not a normal Sunday in one sense. It wasn't normal yesterday as I had to go to the bank and sat in line for 40, 45 minutes. One teller working three drive-ins or drive throughs and then a second one came and helped out. It wasn't normal as I saw just a beautiful day and people trying to work outside. And yet the reality that now we've been closed in. It's not normal here. It's not normal around the world. As I listened to the news last night from England, France, and what's happening in Europe. As I received once again emails from Norway. It's not normal. And yet, it is normal. It is a normal, sinful world. Even the coronavirus, abnormal in its strength, apparently. And yet the world has seen it before. Even nature groans and diseases come as a part of this sinful world. And trials and tests, we face them today as well. But the question is, how do you handle those trials, those tests? George Sweeting used to be at Moody Bible Institute. I remember him as pastor up in Patterson, New Jersey. George Sweeting said this, quote, A Christian is like a tea bag, not worth much until he's been through some hot water. So how are you handling this current, ongoing, growing pandemic? Normal in many ways, but definitely intensified. And so I want us to try and go back to a little normalcy. And yes, we're picking up our study in the book of James. From what we saw in verse 1 two weeks ago, James, I believe, is the half-brother of Jesus. He was a non-believer. He thought, it, thought his half-brother Jesus was uh, mentally unbalanced, to say the least. And yet he was gloriously saved. Gloriously saved because God graciously allowed him a meeting with the risen, resurrected Jesus Christ. No longer as a half-brother, but, but, but able to call himself a bondservant of Jesus Christ as he became a believer. And as he became a very powerful leader in the church in Jerusalem. He showed himself faithful to the end. He died a martyr's death. Here as we close down verse 1, he brings greetings. Greetings to Jewish believers scattered in the diaspora due to persecution, due to heavy trials. No, it wasn't a virus. It was the Roman Empire and Judaism being scattered in consequence. And he could share, rejoice, some of you recall from last Sunday, as we were able to meet, we looked at Psalm 146, and I shared at that time, for such a time as this, it is time for, hallelujah, praise to the Lord. It is time to reflect on the reality of praise to the Lord this morning. And so we're going to see growth in, yes, even these abnormal but normal times shows forth in an agenda for all. I have four questions I would like to ask about the agenda. I would like to ask you, first of all, what's on your agenda? I happen to bring an illustration with me. 
I'm not sure if you can see it or whatever, but it's my calendar. I, I live by this calendar. Um, it's my, my life. It's, it's this week. A number of things crossed out. Uh, this coming Tuesday, I'm supposed to be seeing Esther at Sight and Sound. But I believe this too will be crossed out without having seen it. But there are items in here, including quarterly taxes coming due in April. I assume they're still due, though our 2019 report's not due until July, I guess it is. But in this calendar here, I also go ahead. Uh, 2021, the church uh, electricity needs to be checked on. Uh, in 2023, February the 1st, as a matter of fact, I need to check in for my second colonoscopy. And so that's recorded here for me. I, I live by this agenda. I don't know what you're using. Probably not something as archaic as this. But I can share this very clearly. All of us can take a pencil or a pen because it's not to be erased. And you can write in, in your agenda that trials are coming. Notice the text. When you encounter trials. Not if you're going to encounter them. You will. And all of us are in the midst of one right now with this virus and the upheaval it has caused all of us. Christianity is so relevant. Up front in the scriptures, Jesus made it very clear what it was to be a Christian, what it was to be a disciple of his. He shared in John 16, 33, in the world you have tribulation. Again, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted is the reality of what God's word has to say. There are trials that you can count on on your agenda. But the second question, what are trials? There's a Greek word that's used here. It's called pyrosmos. We find it here with trials in verse 2. Down in verse 13 in the English translation, it's put forth as temptations. Temptations. Temptations being an inner impulse to evil. Uh, different from what we read up in verse 2 with trials. Uh, these trials are examinations. Uh, examinations to test us, to see how strong we are but also to purify us and to build us up in character. Tests, examinations that God allows, that God brings into our world. But they are tests that God wants us to pass. He is not trying to fail us. Some of us can remember from school days, and I can especially remember mechanical engineering test or a physics final, where the professors themselves couldn't even come up with the right answer. God wants us to pass. You need to hear that. God wants us to pass the tests. But they are real. They are trials. Well, what are various trials? Uh, the translation might read multicolored trials. Uh, that same word is found in Matthew 4.24, uh, where they brought to Jesus, as he began his ministry, they brought to him those with, quote, Various diseases and pains. Heinz 57. It's not just something you buy in the store, but it's a slogan that was used in advertising for a product that has become so famous that you can look it up and the meaning is anything that is made up of a mixture of things. Heinz 57 trials. Spilled milk. Again and again. <laughs> A muddied floor, a dented car, a financial reversal as the market drops, hospitalization, death of a loved one, pregnant daughter out of wedlock, disappointments and betrayals by people, persecution for your faith, martyrdom, coronavirus, various trials. And I'm sure that you can add some that perhaps you're going through now that I did not mention. Various trials. One last question. What is it to encounter various trials? The word means to fall upon unexpectedly. Once again, in Luke chapter 10 and verse 30, we read of a man who was traveling. 
from Jerusalem to Jericho. He happened to be a Samaritan. As he walked along the road, he saw another gentleman who fell among robbers, fell upon, beaten down, surrounded by, in the midst of, difficulties, encounter various trials. Uh, Not the trials that we bring on ourselves. Uh, We can do that quite easily. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 15, uh, Peter writes, Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. A busybody, if you please. We can bring trouble on ourselves. You drive through a detour sign and wind up stuck in the mud or off the road. You brought it on yourself. Undisciplined with your time so that you're late again and you rushed and troubles come. You brought it on yourself. We don't give money that is due our God. And so it has a way of disappearing. No, these are trials that you encounter uh, that come upon you not due to your own sinfulness or anything specifically that you have caused it to happen. There's an agenda for all of us. Trials we do and will encounter. And we're in the midst of a big one right now. As we think of those trials, we find there's an attitude to be reflected. An attitude. (laughs) The natural response, the natural attitude is, perhaps, why me? I certainly deserve better than this. The natural response can be self-pity. To be irritable. To be grumpy. Complaining, bitter, discouraged, depressed. All these are pictures of a person who is not in touch with Jesus. Or maybe it's because one is just a non-believer. That's the natural response that comes out of a sinful, natural heart. But God puts forth a Christian response here. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. That's not natural. Joy when I'm beaten down. Joy when, when everything seems to be going wrong. Joy. All joy. Nothing less. Complete joy, full joy, leap for joy. Be overwhelmed by joy. Now our response is, that's absurd. That's masochistic. That's impossible. Our feelings don't naturally respond that way. No. But we are not to be living by our feelings. All of us, I believe, have had extra time. And I finished up a book that the choir received a couple of years ago. David Paulison, Seeing with New Eyes. And he has a number of things to say about what do you feel, chapter 13. We live in a society where the words I feel have become the basis of much decision making and much popular counsel. Well, I feel this way. Over on page 216. As we have seen in potential counseling situations, the ambiguous words, I feel, are uncommonly, or excuse me, are commonly used in four distinct ways. The phrase speaks of experience, emotions, thoughts, or desires. Serious problems arise because the word is typically loaded with authority. If I feel it, then it's inherently true, right, and valid. Oh, Then on 2.18, sheer joy is the characteristic emotion of true intimacy with God and with people. Uh, my, my, My brethren, my brethren, 15 times James will use that phrase in this short letter. He speaks to family because in Christ... We are family, brothers and sisters. And he shares, consider consider it all joy when you encounter these various trials that come your way. Joy. Joy. We are to look beyond our emotions, our feelings. Hebrews 12, 11 shares, quote, All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Seems not to be joyful. Joyful, but sorrowful. 
Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Seems on first impression. But we are told to consider, to look beyond and to see the reality of what's going on. And so in Romans 8.18 I read, For I consider, Paul says, I consider, I look beyond, I examine the whole scenario. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Again, I need to balance the now with what is to come. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. Many of you are so familiar with those verses. Momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. The coronavirus, temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. To look beyond, to see. God is in control. Again, he has not been caught off guard. This is not a surprise to him. It certainly has been to us when you look back just two weeks ago and where we were at. But you notice again as we go back to the text, for that's where we have to go. What does God say? Consider it all joy, my brethren. Consider it. That's a command. But that's not natural. Count it. It's a, it's a banking term that's used here. Add it up and look at the figures and see how it works. Look beyond the present pain. Look beyond the present disappointment because plans have definitely been changed. Think of John Piper in his book, Don't Waste Your Cancer. Don't waste the coronavirus. God has something for each of us even now in the midst of it. I had a Clark. I don't know her. But in our Daily Bread article, she shared about being overwhelmed with grief as she approached church the Sunday morning after her mother had died that week. And just outside the door, there was a little seven-year-old boy standing there with his feet planted right in her path and looking at her. With tearful eyes, he looked up at Ida Clark and said, I prayed for your mother. But she died. As I read here, the sorrowing woman wanted to scoop him up in her arms and cry with him. But she could see he was seriously disturbed because he thought his prayers had not been answered. And so quickly and quietly, she prayed and then said to the Lord, give me the right answer. And she looked at the little seven-year-old boy and said very solemnly, You wanted God to do the very best for my mother, didn't you? The little boy nodded his head, yeah. Well, his best for her was to take her home, to live with him. All of a sudden the boy's eyes began to shine as he realized what was said. God had heard his prayer and God had taken her home. Do I have to remind you that going home is not being on the losing side? Do I have to remind you as Christians that even if we die from the coronavirus, and we're not to be careless with it, I don't believe I am, but we're not to be panicking and fearful as so many in the world are. Some of you have been out when you've been allowed to and go to grocery stores and had people almost curse you down because You maybe came a little too close to their space. People are very much afraid. Christians need not. How many times doesn't Jesus say, Do not fear, I am with you. Let not your heart be troubled. No, to be able to recognize again. Consider it joy because God is in control. He knows what he is doing. Warren Wiersbe put it this way, quote, Our values determine our evaluations. One more time. Our values, what's important to us, determine our evaluations. Value comfort, then trials will upset. 
What do we want? Considered all joy is a command. The Christian's response. And this attitude, this response, grows out of experience. Considered all joy when you encounter various trials. Verse 3, knowing that. Knowing that because you know by experience as you live it out, you've seen who God is in your life and what he's about and what he can do. Ignorance causes so much fear and hurt and needless worry. But knowing that God has a purpose behind everything, we may not know the purpose, but we know that God knows the purpose behind. And as we've seen from the past walking of faith with him, it is to give one security, hope, and assurance in Jesus Christ. An attitude to be reflected. Because I'm a Christian. It's one of joy. It's one of hallelujah. Praise the Lord in the midst of. But then finally, there's an assurance given. An assurance given as I know that. He is at work. The first item we notice is we see the proof of sonship. You notice again back in the text, verse 3, knowing that the testing of whose faith? Your faith. The testing of your faith. It speaks of an individual relationship and it's the only kind of faith one can have. You must be born again. I must be born again. We need to know this Jesus Christ. I remind you, it is not by accident or bad luck that things go wrong in our lives. God is sovereign and in full control. Romans 8.28 is nice to have on your wall. But that's, if that's the only place where you find it, you've got problems. Unless it's within your mind and down in your heart and in your gut that we know that all things work together for good. All things that God is using in our lives. All things, the good and what we would call the bad. And it's not that we're to love the bad things that happen to us. But to realize that even in them, God has a purpose. The proof of your faith. It's either discipline from a loving father. Or it's a refining examination to help us grow. The goal again is to conform us to Jesus Christ, nothing less. Remember, steel needs the heat to be strong, the tea bag, the hot water, to let out the sweetness and the beauty within. The proof of your sonship is seen, or the lack thereof, in how we respond to the trials, yea, even the coronavirus. But second, to see the need for growth in our lives. The need for growth. She was a nurse who worked in a military hospital. And one day as she met the chaplain, she began to complain to the chaplain because she had been rudely treated by some of the men, some of the patients. And the chaplain's odd response was, thank God for that. Thank God because I was rudely treated? Thank God because, well, he said, if you're holding a glass of water and someone bumps into you so that the water spills, the only thing that can come out is what's inside the glass, the water that spilled. Oh, you can only let out what's inside of you. Jesus put it this way, out of the abundance of the heart, the, the mouth speaks. Our response shows again what's on the inside. When we don't handle things well, it shows where we need to grow, where we need perhaps forgiveness and the awareness that I still don't have this part of my Christian character as mature as it needs to be. The need for growth becomes visible when we are put to the test. Thirdly, See opportunities for greater witness. The Apostle Paul writes to the Philippians chapter 1 and, and verse 12 and 13. He shares this. I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances, he's in prison as he writes, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. 
so that my imprisonment, a trial, a testing, not fun, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. I'm sure you've heard before how we had a captive audience. They couldn't run away from his witnessing, and you can be sure he would witness and testify. But being chained to a guy who kept talking about Jesus, God used that for the gospel to spread, for people to be saved. Opportunities. It is said of Justin Martyr that he actually kissed the stake that would put him to his martyrdom, his death. And he said, thank you. You're sending me home. You're sending me home. I want to be with Jesus. And now I'm going to get there. He himself, if I recall correctly, was saved because of the testimony of others who were persecuted. And he couldn't resist what they displayed through their lives. May God use this coronavirus time for us to live out the joy and the realization that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And I can sing it as well with my soul. And of his peace that flows like a river inside in the midst of the crises around me. Assurance is given as I see opportunities for greater witness as I move forward. But, but, but number four here, see opportunities for God's power to be unleashed, for God to demonstrate. I remind you, he's either going to take us home or see that the virus itself doesn't affect us. He may choose to remove the trial or to take us through. But that's his choice. And are you okay with that? Are you okay? Your finances? I received one. I have some Exxon stock from my mother and father's deaths when they left. and I bought out my siblings. And it wasn't much, but it had grown to $31,000. It's now at $19,000. I've gone $12,000 negative. It's God's money. It's okay. It's okay. Can we be comfortable with whatever God has. Yes, opportunities for God's power to work through the circumstances or to continue to work inside me as he shapes me as well. Number five, see opportunities to be honored by Jesus. Peter and the other apostles, I am in Acts chapter four. Excuse me, Acts chapter five. And in verse 41, let me turn there just so I get the words exactly correct. Acts chapter 5, verse 40. Let me read at verse 40. Uh, They took his advice uh, among themselves as to what to do with these apostles who wouldn't be quiet about Jesus. Uh, They took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, back in, uh, they flogged them. That's the one word, flogged. They beat them. The same type of flogging that Jesus got. Probably not to that extent. He was a totally condemned man. You can be sure they felt it. As to what it did to their skin. If it ripped their skin as it did with Jesus, we don't know. Uh, But they flogged them and then ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus. And then released them. So how do we respond from that? God, we try to speak for you and look what we got. (laughs) Not at all. So they went on their way from the presence of the council. And now you've got this word. Rejoicing. (laughs) My brethren considered all joy. Rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. God, you thought we were strong enough to be able to go through this trial. Thank you that we didn't let you down. Thank you for your grace. We're learning that you're in control of all things. To be honored by God by being entrusted to suffer for his sake. I say it again, this Christianity. Miraculous. Amazing. We couldn't put it together. But God did. And we are recipients as we've been born again. Number six. You thought there were only three here. Or four. Number six. See an opportunity to be humbled by God. 
the Apostle Paul, once again. 2 Corinthians 12, you are aware of. Whatever it was that he was going through, we're not told. And commentators have said we are not told so that we can all relate to it. Was it epilepsy? I was a little boy, he's 10 years old, who's suffering quite a bit of epilepsy, apparently. A few other things going wrong with him. They wanted to put him on dialysis, but he's going to Hershey Hospital for operation this Thursday. Kidney stones and a few other things. Was it something wrong with his eyes so that when you looked at him, he was hideous? See with what big letters I write my name here, Paul says. It's because he couldn't see well. He didn't have the glasses that I desperately need. We don't know what it was. But you've got the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul. The apostles have performed all sorts of miracles. <laughs> Either heal yourself or have your fellow apostles pray and heal you. No, go directly to Jesus. And he did, as you know, three times. And I read in the text here, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, because he apparently had a trip to heaven himself, somehow had a vision, and saw the Lord. For this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, from being puffed up, uh, from, from writing the new bestseller, I've been to heaven and back, and let me tell you what it's like. Or to have a movie made. Or to go on a preaching circuit and sell tickets. There was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. And what did he find? Verse 9. He, Jesus, said to me, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Are we finding his grace sufficient? That's the Christian life's promise. We're to be experiencing it. Yes, it is well with my soul. Your grace is sufficient. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through verse 9 there. See it as, a, as an opportunity this, this time here to be humbled by God where we need it. None of us have arrived yet. And the last one here, number seven. See the reality of what God is doing. Of what God is doing. I, I go back to James and let, let's finish out the verse there and see what he says. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Perseverance. Perseverance. You don't throw in a towel and quit. It's a staying power while under pressure. Self-will and natural feelings rejected and God's will accepted. For through trials we see and experience the nearness of God as never before. The nearness of God Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Through trials we receive comfort from the word and the reality of prayer. I remind you again of the word. You've heard me share it before, some of you. First church up in New Hampshire. I was at Camp Spofford speaking for the week when the word came that one of our ladies, Susan Huggard, had lost her little boy, Peter John. I was called to Dartmouth Hospital, or I was told she was at Dartmouth Hospital, and I, I traveled there to see her. And afterwards, she was so kind to me and thanked me for my visit and for what I shared. But then she shared this. I would have lost my mind except for the Word of God. Through trials, we can experience and realize the power of the Word of God as never before. And the reality of prayer, of that one-to-one -one relationship with God. Through trials we can see the shaping power of God within us. Peter was also candidate for many trials. In his letter, which comes right after James, it parallels where we're at right now in James. 1 Peter 1, verse 6 and 7. He has shared here, In this you greatly rejoice. That is the reality of salvation ready to be revealed. Jesus coming back. And this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary. And God is the one who determines if it's necessary or not, not you or I. But if necessary, you've been distressed by, here's 
various or many colored trials. So that the proof of your faith, the testing of your sonship, as we called it here in our first point, so that the proof of your faith, the evidence of a genuine relationship of being born again, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, assayed by fire, assailed by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. God, you are at work shaping. You are creating endurance. I think of a gospel song. I've never loved him better than today. Or I go back to that old chorus from years ago. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. It's to be that way through the pressures. F.B. Meyer, he was a friend of D.L. Moody's. I went on Google to find out more about F.B. Meyer. He lived from 1847 to 1929. F.B. Meyer, a preacher from, from London, he explained it this way. You take a bar of iron, back in his day, worth $2.50. A bar of iron worth $2.50. When made into horseshoes, it's worth $5. If you keep pounding away and, and heating up that iron uh, and, and make it into needles, it's worth $175. If you make it into penknife blades, it is worth $1,625. And if you make it into springs for watches... It was worth back then $125,000. That bar that started out worth $2.50. God is at work on us, even through something like this. As he manipulates, as he hammers, as he heats, as he beats, as he polishes. And the more we allow him to work on us, the greater the value of what he is producing within us for his glory and his purposes. Because our text says again, as I'm back in James, let endurance have its perfect result so that you be perfect and complete. Perfect is a little misleading. We're not glorified yet, but it speaks of maturity, a maturity. For whatever stage we are at as a Christian, mature at that level. A first grader, a first grader. A fourth grader, a fourth grader, not a first grader anymore. High school, I think you get the idea. Maturity, that's what this is all about. Complete, lacking nothing. And I remind you of Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing that he who began, he's going to keep working, working on us. Even as crushed fruit gives the best juice, the fiery furnace, the best steel. I remember being at Buffalo Forge, my senior year in college as we traveled through various industries and seeing the blast furnaces up close as they worked on it. Yes, the heat needed to produce the best steel. Are we willing to allow God to be free to press us and to work on us? And are we able to respond with joy through the pain at times, through the tears at times, but with an inner joy because God is doing his work within us, and then he wants to do it through us. Yes, it is another normal time with an abnormal virus around. And yet it's a time when Christians ought to be able to sing for joy and shout, Hallelujah. Amen. So what is coming out of you? If you claim to be a Christian, if you claim to have the Spirit of God inside of you, then change and upheaval is part of life because he is working. Ask God for all that will help you to look to Christ for life and change and make us more free to serve him through trials, testings, and to do it with, among other emotions, joy. Would you sing with me? Mm -hmm.
for this time together. It's not a normal way for us to gather, and yet, Father, it is a gift for us to be able to have this time. And so, Father, would you work your word into our hearts? Thank you, Father, that your spirit can can do that in a way that helps us to look to Christ, in a way that helps us to be able to see beyond the things that would, would uh, fill us with fear, with frustration, with bitterness, with doubt. And Father, I pray that uh, that we uh, would be able to, to see through this time and that we'd be able to look back and say that you were working in us and you were using us for your purposes. We come to you in Jesus' name. Amen.